Thanks very much. It's uh, really a pleasure to be here. I have to admit that whenever I hear somebody talk about my past careers, it just kind of makes me feel old. Um, <laughs> certainly, I've, uh, I've been around for a while, but uh, as, as Monica mentioned, I've actually only been at FDA for just over a year. I celebrated my one-year anniversary about a week or so ago, and um, it's really a delight at my stage of my career to be in a position like the acting chief scientist because it really allows me to learn a lot about the regulatory activities that go on at FDA, the important work that goes on there, and I'm sure all of you are very familiar with this. I'd also like to thank Hal Baseman uh, and uh, President Johnson. I, I have to say he's not the first President Johnson that came to Washington, but he certainly is among the most prominent uh, for allowing me to be here as your keynote speaker today. Um, I looked over the program well before I came, and I have to say that it's really fantastic. It's information rich, and I'm sure all of you will get a lot out of the activities that go on over the next several days. I also have to say it's really an honor to invite the chief scientist to be the keynote speaker because I think it reflects the very high importance and the high regard that this organization places on regulatory science. And it, it, it certainly is apparent from the meeting itself that PDA really fulfills a critical role in providing key education and information to the pharmaceutical and the biopharmaceutical industry. As was mentioned in the previous presentation, through publications, through a variety of courses, through exhibits, through conferences, and in many other ways, PDA is providing the essential resources for making informed decisions about science and regulation. Therefore, it's, it's really not a surprise, based on what this organization does, that PDA has had such a long and successful partnership with FDA. As was mentioned, this organization has been around for 68 years, but this particular meeting has been co-sponsored by PDA and FDA now for 23 consecutive years. That's really quite remarkable. And, and I think that our shared goals and our values are very evident um, in the conference agenda. As you can see, it's just filled with sessions that are vitally important to industry and also vitally important to FDA. Things like keeping up with the rapid pace of newly emerging fields of medicine, uh, incorporating modern technology into operations, adjusting to new models, dealing with drug shortages. These are all very critical issues, not only for industry, but also for us. And it's also central to our work to be able to ensure the safety and the effectiveness of medical products to protect public health and, very importantly, to advance biomedical product innovation. Um, the significance and the challenges of all of these issues have only grown in recent years because of the rapidly expanding opportunities and discoveries in medical science. These are changes that I'm sure all of you know seem to be occurring at warp speed. There's virtually not a week that goes by that we don't hear of some very significant new scientific breakthrough. There's extraordinary developments in science and medicine and technology and what these allow us is the enormous opportunity to transform how we prevent, how we diagnose, and how we treat many of the diseases that we all deal with through better and more innovative therapies and approaches. One of the quotes that I happen to like is from Theodore Levitt, who is the former editor of the Harvard Business Review, and he said, Creativity is thinking of new things, but innovation is actually doing new things. And clearly, we've been doing a lot of innovation over the last several years, because I was thinking back 
to 23 years ago when FDA first decided to co-sponsor this particular meeting with PDA. And if you think about it, look at the things that have changed in only those 23 years. Who would have guessed that we'd be routinely doing and using genomic sequencing in the way that we do today, not only for diagnosing particular diseases, but also for optimizing treatment of diseases? Who would imagine that we'd be performing synthetic biology for gene therapy and for genetic manipulation? Who would have guessed that we'd be using 3D printing, that it would be a reality and that we'd be using it to create personalized medicine products? Who would have thought that we'd be doing biomonitoring by cell phone? 23 years ago, most of us didn't even have cell phones, and so that was something that I think very few of us could have actually imagined. Who would have anticipated that stem cells would be used as they are today in regenerative medicine? So I think if somebody had stood up here 23 years ago as the keynote speaker and talked to you about some of these things, you'd probably be pretty polite and say, geez, they're really a dreamer or they're visionary. And probably some of you would have said, you know, this guy's probably delusional. Um, you know, or maybe he's crazy, who knows. But it just goes to show you that these things have occurred over such a short period of time and they represent sort of our new reality in terms of innovation. Genomics in silico, predictive toxicology, systems-based biology, personalized medicine, informatics and big data, tissue and stem cell-based therapies. These are just some of the evolving scientific areas that are driving innovation and dramatically increasing the complexity of all of the products that you make and all of the products that FDA has to regulate. So the regulatory challenges that accompany all of these areas don't exist in a vacuum. They must be considered and they have to be addressed in the context of the rapid and profound rise of global markets, global supply chains, changes that are helping to redraw the path that medical products take from development clinical trials, manufacturing, distribution, and ultimately, as was mentioned before, getting to patients. This new model of the way that we do business these days uh, present profound, profound and unprecedented questions of product safety and quality. Sometimes they even deal with national security, as was mentioned with drug shortages. And there are questions about how best to regulate many of these emerging fields. Recent re legislation that's been passed by Congress has helped us to address some of these challenges. They've set new standards, they've granted us new authorities, they've even given us very ambitious goals to meet. But it requires continuing adaptation, continuing response, continuing ev evolution of the way that we at FDA do our business to be able to continue to meet our public health oversight responsibilities. So today what I'd like to talk to you about is, is three areas. One of them is innovation, one of them is collaboration, and one of them is the global nature of our business. And talk about how FDA is working in unprecedented ways through the advancement of regulatory science and in partnership with many different stakeholders to respond to and anticipate the many opportunities that come with this new and ever increasing complexity. I'd like to think that FDA is in the midst of a transformative period in how we approach our mission and how we do our business. Uh, we're trying to advance a new regulatory mindset certainly a new level of partner engagement, especially with industry. And hopefully this is enabling us to move forward in ways that drive innovation, including the development of new regulatory tools, new standards, and new approaches for doing our core 
job of assessing the safety, efficacy, quality, and performance of the products that we're tasked to regulate. Some of these new approaches have been organizational. As mentioned, I am the acting head of the Office of Chief Scientist. This is a relatively new entity at FDA. It was stood up in 2009 in response to a congressional mandate in FDA's uh, FDA Amendment Act, what we call FDA. And the creation of this office and my position was a signal that we needed to have strategic vision and leadership in the area of regulatory science while bringing a new um, importance to regulatory science as the foundation for everything that we at FDA do in terms of regulating products. This is probably one of the few audiences that I don't need to talk to and explain what regulatory science is about. But I think it's really important that you understand just how critical we consider regulatory science to be, not only at FDA, but also, I think, to the job that you do. Because regulatory science, for us, is the way that we are able to couple our understanding of the underlying mechanisms of disease and human biology with new technologies and scientific advances to be able to promote more efficient product development as well as new tools and strategies to make smarter decisions and to make quicker decisions. A robust regulatory science field helps all of us leverage opportunities for innovation and more quickly bridges the gap between scientific discovery and real world products and processes that make a meaningful difference in terms of treating disease and preventing disease. In short, better science means better products. There's little question about that. Although some critics of FDA still view our agency and view regulation in general as a barrier to innovation, I think most of you know nothing could really be further from the truth. We've tried at FDA to reinvent ourselves as being a model of what we consider a successful regulatory agency to be. We've positioned ourselves to be stronger, more effective to meet 21st century challenges, and in particular, we have tried to get away from this model of one size fits all in terms of the way that we do our regulation. For us, innovation is about trying to find new and better ways to do things to meet the challenges that all of us face. That's why our model is no longer one of simply waiting for an application to come through the door. By advancing new and more efficient regulatory processes and bringing a higher level of collaboration to the table, we can encourage and enable new solutions and processes to develop. Speeding the development and availability of drugs to treat serious diseases is in everybody's interest. It's in your interest, it's in FDA's interest, and certainly it's in the public's interest. Especially when we talk about drugs that may be the first available treatment for a particular disease, or that offer significant advantages over existing treatments and therapies. So in response to this need, we've developed several distinct and I think successful approaches to be able to expedite the development and review of these drugs, to make them available as soon as it can be demonstrated that their benefits justify their risks. Many of you know these pathways. They include priority review, fast track, accelerated approval, and our latest breakthrough therapy. They don't simply speed up the process. They offer the developers themselves opportunities to work more closely with FDA reviewers and senior FDA scientists and managers right from the very beginning, from the earliest stages of drug development. Because we know that earlier effective and ongoing communications during development can reduce the overall time of drug development and review. They lead to better products and hopefully they lower product development costs. Since FDA initiated breakthrough therapy designation 
which was part of the landmark Fidesia that I know is on the schedule during this meeting. The most recent numbers show that we've received 202 requests for designation of pharmaceutical products. More than 59 drugs have been designated for review as breakthrough therapies, and six of them have already fully gone through the approval process and received approval. That's really quite remarkable if you think about the usual experience. And I'm especially pleased that many of these drugs that are, have gotten this designation are for rare disease indications. And in addition to that, many of them have already shown amazing clinical results in treating conditions like cystic fibrosis, hepatitis C, certainly that's an area that's gone through revolution. And as you heard, I, my main interest is in the area of infectious diseases. And so I'm really astonished by how we've transformed the treatment of hepatitis C in only the last few years from something that was considered incurable to astonishing rates of success in sustained response and essentially cure. We've also had breakthrough designations for breast cancer. And, and so these aren't sort of minor diseases. These are really important activities that have gotten products and have gotten drugs to market faster and I'd like to think better. CDRH, our Center for Devices in Radiologic Health, is also piloting a new mechanism to be able to bring things to market more quickly. And this is a parallel review program with the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, CMS, in which CMS begins its national coverage determination um, review process at the same time that FDA is in the process of completing its pre-market review. In August of this year, FDA announced the first approval of a product which underwent what we referred to as parallel review. And on the day of our approval announcement, CMS issued its proposed national coverage determination, really a, a new way of being able to do business. CDRH recently proposed a new program to provide earlier access to certain medical devices that are intended to treat or diagnose patients with unmet needs for life-threatening or irreversible debilitating diseases and conditions. This has a very long name. I won't go through the name, but it's easier to refer to it as expedited access PMA or the expedited access pre-market program. This features, just like with breakthrough designation, earlier and more innovative and interactive engagement with FDA. In all of these efforts, no matter what the approval pathway is that's being used, FDA will apply the same statutory approval standards, which are basically safety and efficacy. We can't overlook these. But these new approaches um, have allowed us to advance the underlying goal, which is to encourage greater communication and collaboration to promote the development of better products more quickly and more efficiently. So let me talk a little bit about the second issue, which is collaboration, because it's really a very important aspect in the recipe of what I'd refer to as successful regulatory science. To really be successful, we have to bring together the best minds across industry, across academia, across government, and everywhere else. This allows us to leverage what resources are available, the expertise of our stakeholders, and to be able to closely work with these stakeholders in ways that FDA traditionally hasn't been able to do. Um, it's critical that we are able to do this because it's clearly beneficial to all of us. And because of our unique vantage point at FDA as the regulatory gatekeeper, it enables us to identify the key scientific hurdles, and because of that, we're very well suited to be able to forge new collaborations to develop new products necessary to address today's innovation challenges. Therefore, we've expanded our use of existing mechanisms to develop a number of new types of collaborative projects and programs, particularly public-private partnerships, or PPPs. 
Um, this ability to enter into public-private partnerships was also part of the same act passed by Congress in 2007 that established the Office of Chief Scientist. And they allow us to address focused public health challenges that require a multidisciplinary and coordinated approach. Our Center for Drugs is involved in a number of these public-private partnerships that promote the development of research tools, that promote the development of new platforms, clinical databases, predictive models, to be able to advance our knowledge of disease and drug safety profiles. A great example of this is the recent approval of the drug Zycadia, which is a drug that's used for patients with a certain type of late stage small cell lung cancer. And this particular product very much benefited from FDA's collaboration with industry and health advocacy organizations, another very important stakeholder, to be able to identify the molecular underpinnings of lung cancer to make it possible to classify and treat cancers by specific subtypes, which is one of the main benefits of that particular drug. Another, I think, great example of public-private partnerships is the Lung Cancer Master Protocol, which I'm sure a number of you have heard. This is a, another successful collaboration between a FDA and advocacy groups, um, academic partners, and the drug industry to take advantage of what we refer to as precision medicine. <clears throat> so this protocol involves um, a highly innovative clinical trial design that can be used to simultaneously test multiple new investigational drugs with multiple study arms at multiple sites using whole genome sequencing as the basis to be able to screen patients and ideally suit them into particular treatment arms. It's very efficient, it's a very efficient design, and it will enable several therapies specifically targeted to individuals with specific genetic characteristics to be studied, and it requires really an unprecedented cooperation and collaboration to actually achieve, but there's no question that this type of model will certainly allow products to be able to come through the pipeline more quickly and be properly targeted for those that will benefit most from them. So approaches like this are important not just because of the results that they can deliver, but how they can be adapted or extended to other areas of research and to other types of diseases, bringing together the best expertise from all stakeholders to be able to discuss what needs to be done and take actions to actually do it in new, innovative, and exciting ways. One example that I think is really a very interesting example is something that's called Smart Tots, which has a great name, but actually stands for Strategies for Mitigating Anesthesia-Related Neurotoxicity in Tots, or children. Uh, this collaboration arose because there have been an increasing number of studies that have shown that exposure to anesthetics and to certain sedatives in the developing brains of newborn mice and rats is associated with neurodegenerative changes in the central nervous system. And this has raised considerable concerns about whether or not exposure to millions of infants and young children that are undergoing general surgery that requires anesthetics, that the same thing may be happening in these children. So Smart Tots was developed in 2010 in association with the International Anesthesia Research Society. As a result of this con collaboration, there have been a series of meetings with scientific experts to analyze all of the available research in animals and in humans related to the safety of anesthetics. The partnership is examining all of the available anesthetics and, and the spectrum of anesthetic classes to see if there are particular ones that may be more associated with this phenomenon. Um, they are trying to address whether or not these changes are short-term or that they may be long-term changes. 
um, and what approaches can potentially be taken to prevent or mitigate the development of anesthetic neurotoxicity. They're also examining whether or not there are certain types of surgical procedures, lengths of surgical procedures that may be related to why this phenomenon may be occurring. SmartTOTS is also supporting a competitive grant process to be able to promote research on those very questions. And our hope is that a partnership like SmartTOTS will help to make it possible to more quickly examine and study this vast area of research that's required to be able to answer a very specific question. Beyond the scientific advances that have been generated through these partnerships and through these collaborations, um, this has allowed FDA um, to come up with a number of inventions and transfer these inventions to the commercial market. This is probably a benefit that many people aren't aware of that FDA is engaged in. But in the course of their work, researchers at FDA regularly gain new scientific insights and develop new technologies that can become viable commercial products and advance public health. In fact, we currently hold over 500 invention properties, of which 15% have been licensed for development. Through the transfer of these types of technologies under these licensing agreements, new products and areas that include vaccines, food pathogen detection systems, counterfeit drug detection systems can be developed and made available through the commercial sector. New knowledge is shared through publications or used in collaboration with our outside partners to drive the innovation cycle. One of these examples of um, a technology developed at FDA that's now in the process of being commercialized is something called the Counterfeit Detection Device 3 because it's the third generation of this particular device, something that we also call CD3. It's a very inexpensive, battery-operated, handheld tool that uses alternate wavelengths of light to be able to quickly detect differences between a product that is authentic and one that's potentially harmful or fake. This particular product has received an, FDA, an HHS Innovation Award, and it was created and invented by scientists at our Forensic Chemistry Center, or FCC, which is located in Cincinnati, Ohio. Over the past four years, this particular device has been used in international mail facilities throughout the United States and in some overseas locations at points of entry where investigators, um, uh, FDA field staff, have been able to screen drug uh, ingredients and other finished products to identify fake or unapproved products. This particular device, the CD3, costs a fraction of the price of existing laboratory-based and field-deployable technologies, and it can be readily used by people without any scientific or technical training. Last year, we launched a partnership with the Skoll Global Threats Fund, the U.S. Pharmacopeia, NIH, CDC, and the President's Malaria Initiative to deploy this particular CD3 technology in being able to identify counterfeit or substandard anti-malarial drugs in Africa and elsewhere. As many of you probably know, this is a major problem in the area of malaria treatment, and it's one of the drivers of the development of drug resistance in the disease malaria. Um, we've also signed a letter of intent with Corning Incorporated to refine and improve this particular device so that it can eventually be manufactured and produced on a large scale. These kinds of programs and collaborations don't just happen in a vacuum. They require a lot of hard work and a lot of communication, as well as training in regulatory science and programs that encourage innovation. To stimulate these kinds of efforts, my office has actually created a number of science based programs to support regulatory science, not only in the academic community, but also intramurally. In 2012, we launched FDA's first, what we refer to as the Broad Agency Announcement, or the BAA. 
and this is designed to spur regulation and regulatory science innovation in the scientific community and to be able to leverage knowledge and infrastructure in areas where FDA may have limited expertise or capacities. It's a contract mechanism whereby external partners propose to us particular projects that fit into our schema in the advancing regulatory science documents in one of our priority areas um, to develop projects and programs that benefit us in doing regulatory science that we ourselves may be unable to do. We've now developed 18 contracts through the BAA mechanism, and one of them is something that I think is very important to a group like PDA, which is our first ever national medical device curriculum, which is now available online on our website. <coughs> this is a curriculum that grew out of an FDA innovation initiative to help accelerate and cut the cost of the development and regulatory evaluation of safe and innovative medical devices. One of the things that I, we've noticed over the years is that many of the big exciting ideas in the medical device arena actually comes out of academia or comes out of very small business innovators. And many of these individuals that are producing these products have had difficulty trying to figure out how to navigate the sometimes very circuitous route uh, to be able to uh, work their way through the regulatory process. So together with academic collaborators, we reached out to the biomedical engineering programs around the country um, to ask them how best we could uh, close the knowledge and needs gaps and how to train and stimulate innovation. So out of this came this curriculum, which is a compendium of fictional case studies and a guide for instructors and technology innovators that gives people real world ideas and experiences about how to navigate various aspects of the regulatory product. We plan to develop more of these kinds of case studies and it represents a very important step for us to be able to provide educational materials to train the current and the next generation of medical device innovators. We've also come up with a very innovative program that is run out of the Office of Chief Scientist, which is something called Centers of Excellence in Regulatory Science and Innovation, also known as CIRCES. This was a program that was established just over three years ago. Um, and it's designed to be able to collaborate with academic partners in both the training arena as well as doing specific projects that are relevant to regulatory science. The first two CIRCES were at Georgetown University and at the University of Maryland, and this was very intentional because we thought it was very important that we have geographic proximity uh, of these universities to allow intellectual exchange among faculty FDA staff to be able to attend lectures in both directions, as well as do collaborative research. So under the first two CIRCES, we've address, addressed issues like oncology drug complex manufacturing, improved quality control, and new tissue engineering products. And recently, we've announced the next two CIRCES. One of these is a collaboration between the University of California at San Francisco and Stanford, and the other is at Johns Hopkins University. So it's, uh, it's, it's very important for us to see the growth in regulatory science activities in academic centers around the country. The two new sources are giving us access to world-class quantitative sciences and pharma pharmacologic capabilities, as well as internationally recognized faculty. In addition to the ex external collaborations, we also recognize that it's important to nurture the conduct of regulatory science intramurally at FDA. Um, so there have been a number of cross-center activities that have been developed at FDA. One of them I think that many of you have heard about is the Sentinel Initiative. This is a very large FDA-wide post-market surveillance program that involves many of our product centers and requires collaborative approaches to methods development and validation. We've also, through the Office of Chief Scientists, developed something called the Chief Scientist Challenge Grants. These serve as incubators for researchers throughout FDA 
um, to have seed money to work on innovative and cross-cutting um, uh, scientific projects. Um, it also allows our investigators to work with colleagues in other parts of FDA to meet priority challenges that they all face. Before I close today, I want to get to the third topic that I mentioned before, which is the challenge of globalization and questions related to safety and quality of medical products that increasingly come from outside the country. Many of you have probably heard of uh, Thomas Friedman and his book that he wrote talking about the world being flat. And what he means by that is that we're much more interconnected and um, the developed countries of the world now have much fewer intrinsic structural advantage over developing countries. FDA and our growing responsibilities are living proof of how just interdependent and interconnected the world now is, from the drugs that we take to treat illness to the foods that we put on our dinner table. Currently, FDA regula regulated products originate from more than 150 countries around the world. There are 130,000 importers that we now oversee, and there are 300,000 foreign facilities that bring products into the United States that involve FDA regulation. Therefore, it's not surprising to hear that about 50% of our fresh fruits, 20% of our vegetables, 80% of our seafood, more than 80% of our spices come from abroad. Um, think about that as you go to breakfast over the next couple of days to attend those sessions. But most people don't realize that it also extends onto the product side because 40% of our drugs now come from overseas. And amazingly, 80% of the active ingredient manufacturers are now located overseas. So that's a real challenge for the medical devices, the medical products, the drugs that you all manufacture and produce. Adding to this challenge is the fact that the locations of these suppliers are constantly changing and they're coming from more and more from areas where there isn't particularly strong regulatory oversight and that adds additional challenges to the way all of us do our business. These changes mean enormous new safety and security difficulties. Today's global supply chain has many new steps and potential vulnerabilities and growing opportunities for intentionally adulterated, counterfeit, or otherwise falsified medical products to infiltrate the supply. It's imperative that we ensure that these medical products meet every US standard or the standards of any other country that they are being exported to. So we've already been in the process of trying to change our operational model from what I would refer to as a domestic agency that also operates overseas to one where we're truly a globalized regulatory agency and that we are fully prepared for the complex regulatory environment that considers the risk entirely across a product's life. This new model requires enhanced intelligence. It requires a lot more information than we previously got. And it also, very importantly, requires workload sharing with regulatory partners to help us do our regulatory tasks better and more efficiently. It also requires data-driven risk analytics so that we can identify the highest risk products that are being imported and focus on those particular products. And it requires um, resource allocations in ways that we've not previously done. Global, globalization, without question, requires us to explore new ways to collaborate, especially if we want to be able to stay ahead of the curve, look over the horizon, and anticipate the locations and ways that products are going to be brought to the United States from overseas. This is essential not only for public health, but also for our economic growth. We know that infectious diseases know no boundaries. Certainly in my background, nothing could be further from the truth. 
When it comes to global health, as others have said, there is no them, there's only us. And while we still lack drugs, we still lack vaccines or diagnostics to detect, treat, and prevent some diseases, um, as regulators, we play a critical role in advancing biomedical product innovation to deliver the products that people need. I think you only have to think about the current Ebola situation to understand the many challenges that we have about dealing with infectious disease threats. Um, while I was coming in this morning, it was the lead story on the news once again, um, and many of you are aware of the current efforts around um, um, studying vaccines, studying therapeutics, and studying um, diagnostic assays to be able to address this threat. Um, so there are really some extraordinary examples of applying innovation in regulatory science to make contributions to global health. Let me just mention one, which is the meningococcal A vaccine, the, also known as uh, menafravac, that um, was developed through FDA innova innovation is now making a significant difference in the occurrence of meningococcal disease in the African meningitis belt. There are about 300,000 people that live in the meningitis belt of Africa, um, which for those of you who don't know, stretches right across the Sahal region from Ethiopia to Somalia. Um, classically, there were very significant meningitis outbreaks. These outbreaks tended to affect young adults and adolescents, and so tended to strike down people during the prime working years of their life and so had a really amazingly um, tremendous toll um, in that region of the world. There were vaccines that existed to try to address this problem. They weren't very effective. And so as a result of this, um, scientists in CBER um, created the technology that was necessary to manufacture a safe and effective meningococcal A vaccine against epidemic meningococcal disease at an affordable cost for African countries. Through a technology transfer agreement, we were able to provide this new technology to the Meningitis Vaccine Project, which is a partnership of WHO and the nonprofit PATH. Um, and since this project launched in 2010, there have been over 100 million people that have been vaccinated with this particular vaccine at amazingly only 40 cents a dose. That's, that's really a phenomenal development and it's already made a huge impact on the occurrence of these epidemics in that part of Africa. The partnership model is something that's hardwired into the DNA of any public health emergency um, because as you can see from the Ebola experience, it's essential to coordinate and to have the infrastructure in place to create an appropriate response during an emergency. That's part of the reason why in 2010, we developed the Medical Countermeasures in Initiative, which was mentioned earlier, also known as MCMI, to help prepare us not only for terrorist attacks, but also for natural disasters. This is managed uh, by the Office of Counterterrorism and Emerging Threats, which is one of the offices that falls under the Office of Chief Scientist. And that group works very closely with all other parts of FDA, with other government agencies, with state and local governments, with academia and with industry to develop and evaluate medical products to protect against biological, chemical, radiologic, and nuclear threats. They are at the heart of what FDA is doing as we speak in the area of the Ebola response. So we try to play a pivotal role in establishing clear regulatory pathways for product innovators based on the most appropriate science to ultimately accelerate medical countermeasure development. This initiative has established an action team for things like acute radiation syndrome. This has allowed us to respond if a, unfortunately, if I hope it doesn't occur, to an incident like the Fukushima nuclear reactor problem in 2011. And the technology that comes out of this particular effort can also be used to address acute radiation syndrome and to be able to address the prevention and treatment of radiation injury that occurs in cancer treatment and bone marrow transplantation. 
we can't be prepared for every conceivable threat, but our goal in advancing regulatory science through these types of collaborations is to develop a more sophisticated and nimble science and manufacturing base so that as problems do occur, we can respond more quickly and try to get these products out there as effectively and efficiently as possible. I want to close my remarks today with a quote that you may find a bit surprising. The speaker explained that in the natural sciences there are and have been and are most surely likely to continue to be what I'll refer to as heroic days. Discovery follows discovery, each both raising and answering questions, each ending a long search, and each providing the new instruments for new searches. These comments make a lot of sense, but it's a little bit surprising as to who made this particular quote, and it's the physicist J. Robert Oppenheimer, who said them in 1954. Um, but his remarks really still ring true today, and probably even have more meaning in an era of such tremendous change and innovation. So we face extraordinary challenges in science and medicine, and as a regulatory agency responsible for protecting and promoting public health, we have enormous responsibilities that flow from these challenges. But we're trying to use scientific and technological advances to address these extraordinary opportunities to be able to enhance our ability to strengthen the safety, security, and quality of the medical products that we regulate. So we will continue to, con continue to innovate, continue to in in implement changes so that we can bring the many innovative products to market more quickly, more effectively, and more efficiently. We look forward to continued collaboration with all of you and with PDA to allow our involvement in many more heroic days that will allow us to fully achieve these goals. Thank you very much. I wish you the best for a terrific meeting, and I look forward to any questions that you may have. Thanks again. Thank you.